I'm looking at 1 Timothy 3 again. And I've made it to verse 2. And in verse 2 it says, A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober. And we made it to the qualification about being sober, and these are ideal qualifications for a pastor. A person is not going to meet all these qualifications 100% of the time. So if you're looking for somebody that meets these qualifications 100% of the time, it's going to be hard. Because remember, it says a, a bishop then must be present tense blameless. And blameless doesn't mean sinless. In Titus 1.7, it talked about being blameless as the steward of God. So concerning, you know, being a steward of God, you know, he doesn't need to have just a horrible track record in the past, you know, where you can see this pattern where he's just going to even presently be not somebody you want as a pastor. But then at the same time, he could uh, confess his sins and the Lord's faithful and just to forgive him his sins and to cleanse him from all unrighteousness. Maybe he did mess up, but he's gotten it taken care of. He's got right with the Lord about it. And then if he's wronged somebody, he's went to those people, got forgiveness, and he's right with them about it. And then he's blameless again. So you have to take those two things in consideration, that it's blameless as a steward of God, and you can get forgiveness for what you've done. And then he's present tense, blameless again. And it says the husband of one wife, like we talked about, it can't mean one marriage ceremony because then that would even disqualify a man whose wife died and then he remarried after she died. If, if husband of one wife here means one marriage ceremony, then even the man who got remarried after his wife died would, wouldn't be qualified. You see what I mean? So it can't mean one marriage ceremony. It has to mean more than one wife at a time. And it says must be present tense the husband of one wife. Think of a man you know that's been divorced and remarried. And you look at that man. Do you see that man as having two wives? No, you don't. You know that he divorced his other wife and he's now married to this woman. He doesn't have two wives. He's got one. To say that he's got two wives is like you're saying that God doesn't recognize divorce and he obviously does because just like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 7, if, you know, talking about if they depart, let them depart. You're not in bondage in such cases. If your husband or wife departs from you, you're not in bondage to be single for the rest of your life. If your spouse dies, you're not in bondage to be single the rest of your life. So God does recognize divorce, and he doesn't consider a man that's his wife left him, and then he got remarried. God doesn't consider him having two wives. He has one wife. And it says to be vigilant. You're, you're walking circumspectly. You're like a watchman because the devil's walking around. And it says, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, has a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And then that, the next one is be sober. And that has to do with just being serious, being temperate, not constantly joking around, not constantly jesting around. Like Ephesians 5, 4 says, if you look at Ephesians 5 and verse 4, this would describe a man that's being sober. And it talks about neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. You know, not constantly just saying stupid stuff. Can't even be serious. And you talk to somebody sometimes, you can't even have a serious conversation with them They'll be smiling the whole time you're talking, laughing about everything that you're saying, and everything's just a big joke. Even though it should be serious, they're joking around about it. That's not being sober. That's really being uh, childish and immature, seemingly. And then uh, the next one, he said in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior. You know, 
just like he talked about in that verse we looked at last time in Titus 3, Titus 2, 3, where the woman needs to be in behavior as becometh holiness. Your, your behavior needs to match somebody who's holy. Do people see how you act as holy? I mean, you think about it, the pastors are, you know, deacons even that you work with. Do people see those people as just unholy people? There's this one guy that's a deacon that I know of, and a guy just told me that if he if somebody didn't tell him he was a de that that guy was a deacon, he would think that guy didn't even believe in God. That's how bad he's acting. He's not being in behavior as becometh holiness. And then the next one is given to hospitality. You know, hospitality, like hospital. Now, what does it mean if you're given to hospitality? That means you're willing to receive somebody into your home for food, for clothes, for counsel. You're hospitable. And then it says apt to teach. And this is a big one. Notice that it didn't say apt to preach. And that's really all. They think, you know, most pastors today, they think that it's all about preaching. And there is no teaching. The, um, they think that that's just, it's kind of weak and soft. I mean, at least around where I live, they don't do much of it. They they put it on the shelf. It's it's seen as something that's that's kind of weak. They think if you're just talking like I'm talking, then you're dead. You, I mean, I'm giving you the Bible. The Bible's alive. The Word of God's what's quicken what quickens you. The Word's what makes you alive. It's not dead. It's alive. And if you're giving somebody the Bible. You're teaching the Bible. You're constantly talking about the Bible. You're constantly saying the words of Scripture. That is live words. That's putting life in people. Just like you're drinking water. That's what the Bible's like. It's like coming to a, a fountain of youth and just drinking it with a straw. Just sitting there drinking it. That's what the Bible's like. It's not... You see, they think if you're not yelling, kicking, and screaming, jumping around, then that's, that that's not preaching, and that's just dead. That's not true. <clears throat> and they've, they've put teaching on the shelf, and it's just, it, it's sad because nobody knows anything anymore. Nobody has assurance of salvation anymore. They don't know the doctrines of salvation. They don't know a about they've they've heard the words just from being exposed to the Bible. They've heard you know words like redemption and justification and propitiation. Probably not spiritual circumcision, which would really help them with eternal security. Maybe they've heard the word eternal security or justification, things like that. But they don't know what they mean because you can't just mention these things in passing and somebody know what they mean. Like a lot of times. You might hear a pastor, he mentioned these words in passing, but nobody knows what it means. You got to really slow down, break it down, tell them what it means. They have no idea about anything because the, the pastor's not teaching anymore. And it's his responsibility. It's your responsibility to be apt to teach. That is the qualification for a pastor. So apt to teach studied up just like it says in second timothy 2 15 this famous verse study to show thyself approved unto god a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth you don't see that no more you don't see i mean you ask the average church member what does it mean to rightly divide the word of truth they don't know they know very very little and you know you see the uh you just lit, you turn on a pastor, depending on what type of culture or what part of the country you're in, you turn it on, they all sound exactly the same. And they think if you're not doing those same voice fluctuations and things that they got, I mean, you can turn one of them on, he got the same flux, voice fluctuations as the other guy, same movements as the other guy. If you aren't looking at them, you might think it's the same person. And all they're doing is just, they're just saying the same things over and over and over and over again. 
He's saying the same thing he said, the same little cliches, the same little things that uh, that they say all the time. Never giving somebody the Bible, never edifying anybody. It's like really they're only up there to show these people how great of a preacher they are. They don't care about giving the people the Bible, getting people interested in the Bible. When you're apt to teach, your goal should be to get these people as interested in the Bible as you possibly can. Not trying to impress people, not showing, trying to show people how great of a preacher or teacher you are. Get people interested in the Bible. And then you're, you know, you're not just giving them a sip of water. You're then leading the horse to all the water. And the Bible is like water. And that's what's going to keep them alive. You know, you got, there's great preachers and they get up and they make you feel bad on Sunday. And you get right on Sunday, but he didn't lead you to water. He just gave you a little sip. So you're right back into doing what you was doing on Monday. It's, uh, you know, emotional stuff. It'll make you get you a little feeling for a day or two. But then when you go back to work on Monday and Tuesday, the feeling's gone. You can't just live on feelings all the time. You got to be led to the to the word. And then if you led to the word and that becomes a part of your everyday life because you so a man's got you interested in the Bible, then Monday you're not hearing your pastor preach, but you got your Bible open and you've been led to the water and that's going to keep you going through the week. You open it up on Tuesday. You open it up on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, every day, not just on Sunday. So apt to teach. And then, you know, like in Ephesians 4 and verse 11, it talks about how the Lord has gave pastors and teachers. In Ephesians 4, 11, it says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Notice how that pastors and teachers, it's almost like it just goes together there. And what's those guys for? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So you're, you're in this for the perfecting of the saints, for the edifying of the body of Christ. You know, you're helping people grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And he talks about in 1 Timothy 4.13. In 1 Timothy 4 and verse 13, he said, Paul said this to Timothy. He said, till I come, give attendance to reading. So you want to be constantly reading, constantly learning something. And you can tell when a guy is constantly studying, constantly learning something to give to the people because it's just really fresh. You can tell when he's still just living on what he learned 20 years ago because he's saying the same thing over and over again. And see, you want to replace... You see, you're always forgetting something, so you want to replace what you're forgetting with something new that you learned. And if you're not constantly learning something about the Bible, pretty soon you'll know nothing. It just except for like the little basic stuff. And I mean, you need to go beyond just the fundamental things. You know, there's a whole lot more in the Bible than that. And the Bible talks about milk, but it also talks about strong meat. And a lot of, uh, it's like pastors think, well, I'm going to make people bored if I teach the Bible. And they're not going to come back. Well, you don't care to get up there and say the most offensive and rough and mean things and make people leave for that reason. So why do you care if they get bored and leave? He said be apt to teach. He's, he's, he said you're supposed to teach stuff to faithful men that they could be able to teach others also. But teaching, it's a lost art. It's, put, it's been put on the shelf. It's seen as something that's it's not as good as preaching. It's, it's weak. That's the way, it's like the way that they see it for some reason. And they don't like it. They think you're, if you're just teaching, then, it, then it's dead. That's not true. The Bible's alive. And if you're teaching the Bible, 
You're teaching life. And then it says, not given to wine. And this is a big one. It's a real controversial one. You know, he says, not given to wine. And he in First Timothy five twenty three, look at First Timothy five twenty three. This is one that a lot of people will use to say that it's okay to drink alcohol. Where it says in First Timothy five twenty three, he said, "Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities." And they say, "See, you can drink wine, but." There's actually more than one type of wine in the Bible. Look at Isaiah 65 and verse 8. If you look at Isaiah 65 and verse 8, it says, Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, Destroy it not, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servants' sakes, that I may not destroy them all. So he said, New wine is found in the cluster. So it's just new wine, and the that's just a cluster of grapes. So new wine is just grape juice. Or like in Proverbs 3 and verse 10. Look at Proverbs 3 and verse 10. It says in Proverbs 3, 10, So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst with new wine. So... If it's just off the presses, it can't be fermented wine. It's grape juice. So new wine, according to Isaiah 65, 8 and Proverbs 3, 10, is just simply grape juice. So there's two kinds of wine in the Bible, old wine and new wine. New wine is simply grape juice. So when Jesus made wine at the wedding, it was just grape juice. He wasn't making alcoholic wine. But that's the ones everybody want to throws wants to throw at you to say that it's okay to drink. And that verse in 1 Timothy 5.23 where he said, Use a little wine for thy stomach's sake. Maybe he's just referring to new wine there. And if he's not, if he was referring to fermented, fermented wine, he just said, Use a little for thy stomach's sake. As like in medicine. Like in some medicines, have a little bit of that in there. Uh, I guess cough medicine and whatnot has a little bit of that in there. But that doesn't mean, you know, just going out and having drinks and everything else. Because you got to think, look at it like this too. Even if, uh, even if it was okay to just drink a little bit, imagine what that would do to your testimony. Especially as a pastor that people's looking up to for spiritual things you know you go to work imagine just be real with be real for a second you go to work today and you got your bible out and you're trying to lead people in the bible way and then friday night they go somewhere and they see you with a big glass of beer or, or wine or whatever what are they going to go to work and say about you they're going to say he's a bit hypocrite because the lost man knows that a Christian shouldn't be drinking. The lost world knows that. You're really going to hurt your testimony. You're not staying away, from, staying away from the appearance of evil. You're putting yourself in a situation where it's possible you, that you could get drunk even. And if you, it's like this. If it's okay to drink a little bit... You know how how do you know how much you can drink if you've never get, if you never get drunk how do you know how much you can drink before you will get drunk and how much does it take to really be considered drunk and to lose some of your judgment you see so the best thing to do is just stay away from it be, the pastor needs to not be given to wine you know other than possibly in medicine like he said use a little wine for thy stomach's sake but then even at that, maybe he was there. Maybe he was talking about grape juice, new wine. And in 1 Timothy 3.8, 1 Timothy 
one of the qualifications for the deacon was, likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine. And they say, see, you can drink a little bit, but here he told the he told the pastor not to be given to wine. And if you're not given to wine at all, then you're not given to much wine either. So not given to wine. And then it, the Bible also talks about the excess of wine. And it seems the excess of wine is simply just drinking fermented alcohol, period. For example, in 1 Peter 4, 3, in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 3, it said, For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. So it said, excess of wine, then it said, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with, this, not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. Now you see that it said excess of wine, but it says excess of riot. Is any riot good? No, none of, no, no, none of that rioting is good. So it's not just meaning, you know, a little bit is good. Just like where it says excess of wine... That doesn't mean a little bit is okay because a little bit of riot isn't okay. So you see what I mean? It seems the excess is in the wine itself, not just simply over drinking it. And then, you know, Proverbs 23, 31. Proverbs 23, 31. It says, Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright, at the last it biteth like a serpent, and it stingeth like an adder. So you're not even supposed to look at it. How could you drink it? It says, Thine eyes shall behold strange women. That's how you, that's how you end up going to bed with people that you don't even know. It's through wine. It talks about in Habakkuk 2.15, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest the bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on your nakedness. You know, that's why somebody gets somebody to drink a lot of times, so they can see your nakedness. It said, He said, Thine eyes shall behold strange women, thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth on, on the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. Sounds pretty miserable to me. So not given to one, but give yourself to something better. You see, it said not given to wine, you can give yourself to alcohol. You see people all the time, they've given themselves to alcohol. That defines that person. What are they known as? A drunk, alcoholic. They've completely given themselves to wine. A pastor needs to give himself to something better. He needs to give himself to the Bible to the learning the Bible so that he can teach others and edify them and have them grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Prayer and ministry of the Word is something to give themselves to. Instead of being addicted to alcohol, addicted to some type of drugs, you know, Acts 6, 4 says, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. And it talks about, about them being addicted to the ministry. It talks about how they addicted themselves to the ministry. In 1 Corinthians 16, 15, it says, I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry. So they're not addicted to alcohol. They've given themselves over to the ministry to the edifying of the body of Christ. So he said, not given to wine, back in 1 Timothy 3, he said, not given to wine, no striker. So he's no striker. 
You can't be quick to violence. You can't just be quick to just tall off and punch somebody in the face. You can't be such a quick-tempered person all the time. You know, First Timothy or Titus one seven. It's talked about and said, for a bishop must be blameless, as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry. If you're soon angry and just got this hot temper, you're going to be quick to strike somebody. If you're, and then it said, not soon angry, not given to wine. If you're given to wine and you're soon angry, you're really going to hit somebody. And it said, no striker in Titus 1 7 as well. So you can't just be have this horrible temper all the time. And then it said, uh, he said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 3, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre. So you can't be all about the money, which leads to evil. You know, the famous verse, 1 Timothy 6.10, For the love of money is the root of all evil. When you, are, as a pastor, begin to start loving the money, then what are you going to do? You're going to start compromising the message to keep the money flowing in. You know, you need to feed the flock of God because you love them and the Lord, not for the filthy lucre. It's like it says in 1 Peter 5.2, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. So, when you're preaching for the right reasons, you don't care about the money. When you're a hire, what's called a hireling, then you care about the money. Just like it talks about in John 10, 12 through 13, he said, But he that is an hire, hireling and not the shepherd whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he's a hireling, he careth not for the sheep. You know, he's just a hireling, only in it for the money. And then you got guys who uh, teach the sheep things that they ought not for filthy lucre's sake, as it talks about in Titus one eleven. They're teaching things that's not true to keep the money flow coming. And they make, uh, in Second Peter 2, 3, it talks about those who, with feigned words, feigned words as faked words, with feigned words, pretend words, they make merchandise of people. That's exactly what you see today on TV. These pastors, are uh, they get gullible people and they teach them things that they ought not for filthy lucre's sake, and they make merchandise of them. They're getting rich off people. They're living like rock stars. If you're a pastor living like a rock star with the money you made from being a pastor, that's just something ain't right. So men may speak well of them. You know, Jesus said in Luke 6, uh, in Luke 6 26, he talked about uh, people speaking well of people. And he said, Woe unto you when all men speak well of you. So, For so did their fathers to the false prophets. You may have a, a preacher, everybody speaks well of him, but most likely he's compromised the message. So you'd uh, be better off to teach the truth and have everybody hating on you. you. You You may have people speaking well of you, but you're acting like one of those sons of Belial back there in first Samuel chapter 8 and verse 3 who were not doing what they should have been doing being over people having the responsibility of be, of helping people spiritually and then he said patient first Timothy chapter 3 he said not greedy of filthy lucre but patient because everyone is on a different level in their walk they're, they got different personalities. They got different setbacks. They got different strengths. They got different weaknesses. So you should preach with long suffering. But we'll go ahead and stop there. And next time, look more at being patient, the patient qualification and not a brawler.